Hey there everyone and welcome to the final video of my annual review series for 2022. We're rounding this off by talking about the water monsters that came out this year and then we're going to talk about uh, kind, kind of some general summary things. So the sections of this video which you can get to uh, through links in the description like all the other ones. First off we're going to talk about water, uh, the themes in that element, then we're going to talk about the new monsters and um, this I'm calling the Year of Union. There's going to be a slide on that at the end of the video of why I'm calling it the Year of Union and how Union's kind of becoming a bit of a more of a key thing in the game. Then we're going to talk about the highlights and the power level of um, the new water monsters. And finally, the summary of uh, 2022, where I'm going to talk about, you know, the power level, all the new monsters, some of the more general things, my favourite monsters from the year, and where I think things are heading generally. So let's start this off by looking at water themes and things. So water, it's one of the sort of middle ground type elements, uh, not super aggressive, not super defensive. It does a bit of all that stuff. Um, it's got some controlling stuff in it. Generally speaking, it's pretty strong in PvP. It's got a good mixture of, um, of sort of shields, stealth, uh, speeding things up, piercing kills, control with sleep or stun all that kind of stuff. So there's a bit of everything uh, that you can dip into, and it generally turns out very, very strong. Um, so as you can imagine, there's a lot of aquatic monsters in here. Um, we haven't got too much aquatic union yet, but when that does become a thing, uh, Link Water Aquatic Union will probably be a pretty big deal. And um, yeah, otherwise we've got some beasts and reptiles. Uh, reptiles being, yeah, slightly more of like a, you wouldn't necessarily tie it to water, but that is where, where quite a few of the reptiles are. Um, I think I've put some beasts on basically every element. <laughs> it's really split across all of them, uh, but there are definitely some some beasts all around. And in terms of the new monsters we got this year, um, we got the most full defense monsters in mortar of uh, all the elements, um, which is generally kind of like one of those things that's like, okay, if they're full defense, they're generally stronger. So um, yeah, there's some cool stuff in here. With all my tier ratings, um, they are just more, you know, they're kind of my personal opinion. Yes, there's input from the community, but ultimately it doesn't say how strong a monster is. You know, it, it's like us trying to figure out how strong it is, but not actually how strong it is in practice. So um, some of the tier ratings that I have, I have then really gone back on later on. I'm going to mention this slightly uh, later at the end of the video, um, that some of the monsters from this year, which I've talked about already, I have adjusted since, uh, you know, since I took the tier ratings for making these videos. Um, but I'm speaking more from like previous years. Uh, for example, last year, the shadow video um, is a kind of a regret of mine that I, I hyped up a lot of those monsters, but they weren't super high on the tier list. And then, you know, now we are like a year later and actually I've put a lot of them higher on the tier list. <laughs> so it doesn't always reflect how strong they are when I talk about them in, this, in these videos and uh, we later find out how strong they are. Um, anyway, so I'm saying all that because um, water, I don't think, is the most well-supported element this year. However, it is notable that they have a bunch of tanky monsters that may prove to like round out the element very nicely for the long run uh, to make it really strong. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of like general trend, everything's being tanky, that kind of stuff is going to fit better into that. Uh, so the new monsters we got, we got one mythic, five legendaries, and three super epics. Two of those three super epics are the um, cycle, the super epic cycles. So it's actually only kind of like one that we're going to talk about here. Also only one mythic. So it's basically mostly legendaries that we're going to talk about in this video. Um, but yeah, let's move into the themes of water. What does water do? Well, camouflage is one of these cool things. So uh, this is something that started in shadow, but then moved into water. And water's had a fair bit of support uh, in it over the years. So now we've got quite a lot going on. Last year, I spoke about Lilithia in the middle there, um, who does, uh, she stealths things that come in. And I was saying how, yeah, technically she stealth support, but actually a lot of the sneak attack monsters already come in with stealth. So she doesn't really support them that well. Well, turns out in the last year, she got buffed. So now she not only stealths them, but also shields them. So she does now uh, support stealth monsters quite a bit better. And, you know, having the combination of stealth and shield um, is a massive pain to deal with. Uh, so I would say she's she's actually, like, you know, properly a, a, a stealth support monster now. And Fiona obviously is, like, the, the insane support monster. Uh, but we've got a bunch of stealth monsters on this. Um, we've got a lot more foggy entrance in general. Uh, we had um, Sorrel in the Shadow video. We've got another foggy entrance legendary in this video. 
Um, and, you know, we got one last year of uh, the Cephalaganda, uh, which is uh, down there at the bottom that I just sort of tagged on. Um, so stealth is definitely becoming more of a thing in the game. Um, there's a lot more stealth around. Stealth Bane is becoming a more sort of powerful uh, move that you should probably be including into teams. And uh, Water has camouflage stealth support um, built into it, so it can do um, it can do some really cool stuff with it. And you don't necessarily have to be Link for this as well. Um, you know, some of these monsters are Link, but um, you can be using some of the stealth support stuff from other elements. You know, some of the foggy entrance from other elements and support some of these monsters um, perfectly fine. So that's enough about that one. We've got the sleep theme. Not going to talk about this too much. Uh, basically, there's a bunch of sleep in water. Used to be a really big deal. Sleep has kind of slightly gone by the wayside in terms of design. Um, they don't do a whole lot of it because it can be really oppressive if it was too strong. Um, but uh, so they have loads of counters to it. And then, you know, if they made like really strong sleep monsters, it would just go down a path which is not so good, which Stun basically did over the years of the game. Uh, they ended up making... Um, two strong stun monsters, then two strong stun counters that they then made stronger stun monsters and stun, stun support stuff that then they had to like, they've had to go and go crazy with stun counters and it's just, it, it's sort of a, you know, a nasty, uh, dangerous path that uh, is not healthy. Um, so they didn't do that with sleep. Um, but yeah, sleep's very strong. You can use it in a team, um, sort of dip into it, not go all the way into it, I would say, because all the way into it, you then get messed up by the counters to it. Um, but yeah, some really strong stuff here. Um, Polarian is one which I always used to like uh, be a little down on, but since they gave it the secret skill to like instant sleep something, Polarian can give you a lot of control in a battle. Um, it's something I use in my Link Water team. And then finally, we have the Detox slash Poison sub theme. So this is a really cool one uh, that has got some support, not a whole lot of support, and it's the way that you know Water uses poison a bit. I mean, to be honest. Uh, water's got a lot of like the poison damage details as well. Uh, well, I say that a lot. No, okay, they got some. Um, it's basically not all about detox, is what I'm trying to say there. Um, it's just got a bit of detox mixed into it. I'd love for this to be explored some more. Um, I think it'd be really cool. Um, I'd love for Atlan Tyrant to get uh, buffed, um, so it's a bit more pushed and make um, something like this a bit more worthwhile. But anyway, that's uh, that's another sub theme. Let's move into the monsters themselves. First, we've got a couple of super epics, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, Elf and Dragon Blah, this is covered in the fire video where I covered all the cycles at the beginning. So go watch that if you want to see it. This one was the worst one. <laughs> it's really bad. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that's that. We also have got, uh, Gummy Dragon Blueberry. So this is in the fire video too. Go watch that if you want to hear about this one. Uh, this is one of my, one of my more favoured Gummy Dragons. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that's that. So the one we're actually going to talk about is Turbo Tusk. Uh, this, you can see, is pretty high in the tier list. I like this one quite a lot. I haven't seen it played too much. It, it's, like, quite recent, so uh, we haven't really seen it in play too much. But it's a very cool idea on making a PvP viable uh, stun protection super epic. So you want to use it in the front line. Um, that's this, you know, this actually unique passive at the moment, frontline shield, um, which given the fact that it's got quite good defense, uh, means that it survives pretty well. And when it gets a turn, it does pretty good stuff because um, Fast Strike, you know, it's not the most amazing damage, but can kill some squishier things. True Hit, if they've got a Protector, that's going to be brutal. Um, but the reliable thing here is the Give Turn. And generally speaking, Super Epics with Give Turn and, like, you know, tanky stats or whatever, they are somewhat viable. You know, you can use them, they will work, they just won't perform quite as well as Legendaries and Mythics. But this primary thing, uh, the primary thing this thing does is actually stun protection. So having, being stun protection plus a tanky give turn monster is a really good place to be for a super epic. And then, you know, having the true hit as well means that if you come across protectors, it becomes really, really strong. Um, so yeah, this is this is a cool monster. Um, it also sacrifices itself. I think that's just amazing design. So there are going to be some cases where you know you don't come across, you don't come against stun, and you don't come against against protectors, and then this feels like a super epic on the battlefield. You know, it's not as strong as other monsters. Well, if it gets left alive for two hundred seconds, then you can go ahead and kill two enemies and sacrifice it. Uh, that also is great because. Um, 
generally speaking, what you'll do in a team is you'll put stun protection sort of space throughout the team. So this will be your frontline stun absorber, but then you may have something in sixth slot or seventh slot, something like that. And so if this has survived for 200 seconds, probably you're at the stage in the battle where you have like another stun absorber on the battlefield or some other, you know, some stun counter or whatever. You don't need the stun protection from this anymore. You, In fact, you kind of want it gone. So being able to remove it from the battlefield is amazing. Um, and, you know, you're killing two enemies when you do that, which is, which is obviously great. Um, so really good in a lot of ways. I really like the design of this. Uh, Thundering Shield is also... Um, uh, I want to take some, some credit for this. I actually kind of designed that. Um, so... You know, they originally came up with the idea, Bobby Boom, 400 seconds uh, stun, and then it explodes on the enemy team. And I was like, yes, more of this. This is excellent. Um, this is a way to make stun absorbers worthwhile. Have them die when they get stunned over 400 seconds, so they don't just sit around as dead weight. And give a benefit to your team as well. Um, so I was saying, like, okay, small benefit from Super Epics. Legendaries give brilliant benefit. And then uh, Mythics can be some, you know, incredibly powerful benefit and stewarding your team is a nice benefit to have so turbo tusk great job for stun protection great job as a frontline um you know a super epic that can't really be ignored for too long um as well as being impactful on the battlefield um like i said i haven't seen it a huge amount yet i don't think it's anything crazy you know it's not as strong as like the most amazing super epics out there but it's definitely a viable monster that will perform well um in the right kind of teams so moving into legendaries, uh, the first legendary to talk about is another one which I find really cool, um, Arter Claws. This is what I would like to say as a sort of modern style protector, where um, it's aggressive and it just can be a protector if you want it to be. Um, that's the kind of way how you can fit a protector in that will be fun, that people want to use, that's not oppressive, uh, by because some protectors, they like, for example, Skeleviath and... Basically, it doesn't it doesn't really do much on the battlefield. So, what do you have to do with it? Well, you have to like push it so far in the direction of like it's a protector that it becomes really annoying to play against. Skeleviathan is just super tanky and high speed, and then when you kill it, you lose one of your monsters. It's just really horrible to play against, and like it does the job of being a protector, but you wouldn't really want you know five or ten Skeleviathans in the game. That's just like that's not good. Um, so something like Articles is really nice to like be able to put a protector in but it's not going to uh yeah because it's got all the aggression it doesn't have to be a crazy protector because this is a protector it's not that great you know it doesn't really do that much but the fact that it can protect is awesome for the cases where you would want that uh, it only adds one cost on as well and because it's on the secret skill you can choose to not have this as a protector in which case um you can like use raw monsters with it and that kind of stuff. Um, so the design of this is really cool. And if you don't immediately see it, I, I will just explain it now. Um, so with the good speed, it will get a turn and then basically it hits three different elements. So it hits uh, storm, uh, water and fire. Storm, water and fire are ironically the best link elements in the game. And we do see a lot of those elements in PvP. Um, so it's really good for dealing with them. Uh, the amount of damage it deals with those moves is also enough. You know, it's really good. Uh, Counter Strike is a strong move. Kinslayer too. Flame Eater, great move. Um, Flame Eater is also great for killing an enemy that's on whole ground or you know something that's on low HP uh, because it still kill. It still gets the minus hundred seconds uh, when it does that. So it can kill three elements. Now let's say there isn't uh, you know one one of those elements on the battlefield. What does this do? Well, it can't really kill anything. However, it can send itself back. And this is actually, you know, quite high speed send back from the front line. There's no restriction on that send back. Um, and then it can go to the back of the team. So whether or not there's something to kill, it can, you know, it's not dead weight on the battlefield. If there is something to kill, it can kill those things. And then, you know, when there's no longer any targets, then it can send itself back as well. At the back of the team, then when it comes in, um, it will be, you know, relatively fast again, get a turn relatively quickly. Then it can protect. And then... Uh, so whether or not there's a target for it, the protect is key because when it dies, it basically gives your your team a, a, a turn. You know, it gives it does a team turn. So 
that's where the protect can come in. You can use it as a protector at the front if that would be useful, or uh, the main design of it is you kill things, you send it back at some point, and then at the back of the team you make it a protector, and then it's a team turn at the back of the team. The fact it's also got stun converter is really nice, so it can um, you know kill enemies and sometimes will get extra turns. Um, but do bear in mind if you have the secret skill turned on, it does have both chrono weakness and protector weakness, uh, which means it can be punished quite hard. Um, so yeah, all that considered, I think it's very balanced, but I love the design of it. I think it's really fun. Uh, we haven't really seen anything like this in the game where it's like kind of got a two-stage process, you know, you put it in anywhere in your team, it does some, some kind of killing, maybe it doesn't, you send it to the back, protects, gives you a team turn there, as well as maybe some killing at the back. Um, really, really cool design. And this was one of the uh, very <laughs> anti-fire monsters that came out this year. Um, you know, Flame Eater, obviously it counters fire like mad. And with Stun Converter, this is this is a really harsh counter to, uh, to Link Fire, uh, basically. And uh, one of the key monsters for that, which, funnily enough, hasn't really been needed because they nerfed fire that it's actually gone out of the meta uh, temporarily. Um, when Link Fire kind of comes back again, then Arctic Claws will be, will be really good for that. Um, so yeah, Article is a really cool monster. Let's move to the next one. So the next is Sataskagan. This is one which I really wanted to hate, but I couldn't st I couldn't hate it. And it's actually got so many fans in the community, and I've come around on it more. Um, but I will tell you what I don't like about it first. The first the thing I don't like about it is raw catapult is too weak. So this is full defense. It's a very tanky monster. However. Um, so, you know, having piercing one-shots, like, would be too much. Like, if this could one-shot with raw catapult, it would be way too good. But it doesn't really. Um, it can kill the sort of lower HP legendaries, that's the thing. And doesn't really do too much against mythics. Um, so, it's balanced in that way. However, the stuff that this does do is very, very good. So, even though I say the damage is not that brilliant from raw catapult it does one-shot some things. Or, you know, if something's just hurt a bit, it can then kill it off. And that's quite good when, actually, the main thing about this monster is it's got raw hypnotize that can put an enemy to sleep, and, you know, that, that that's just an insane move. It is so powerful to do that. Um, Securalisk has that. Securalisk is one of the best mythics in the game, and part of that is because it's got raw hypnotize. So raw hypnotize is a very powerful move, and then this sits around as a stun, as stun protection that they have to deal with at some point. So, on paper, it doesn't look the most amazing thing. You know, Ultra Flux is just kind of bad. Raw Devour, well, that's a random heal move thing. You can summon one rock every 100 seconds, and you've got a poor damage move. I look at this, and I'm like, why? No, this isn't that great. However, <laughs> it actually works really nicely in practice, because in practice, you, that sleep has a massive impact. It can do piercing kills. Um, it can also heal itself up to make itself really difficult to kill. Um, at times, sometimes, you know, that's that's a big deal, uh, because the 400 second Mega Bomb goes off much sooner than you'd expect. Um, it does take a while, obviously, and in PvP, it's not going to just kind of naturally happen. Um, but if you put this in any kind of controlling setup, it enables that because it also has raw hypnotize. Um, so if Sataskan takes out one enemy, you have another monster that's put something else to sleep, then you've only got two enemies to deal with, and uh, then you know you can basically hold control sort of slow roll it, you know, not actually kind of decimate their team, and then you can very easily pass that 400 seconds to get the Mega Bomb going off. So it goes off much easier than you'd expect because of that. Um, it's also brilliant in PvE in certain setups uh, where you can pass time easily um, because it kind of just passively hits it hits around stealth and all that kind of stuff. It's not like a normal active Mega Bomb where like um, stealth will, uh, will avoid it. Um, and yeah, otherwise it's stun protection. So this is really, really tanky stun protection that can do all that sort of passive controlling stuff. Uh, well, sorry, yeah, controlling stuff. Um, it's not the kind of monster that you just jam into any team. Um, it's not the most incredible monster, but if you build around it carefully enough, if you build it in some kind of team that's like wanting to, uh, to kind of take control of the battle and hold it um, and not clear its way through the enemy team super fast, uh, this is a really good addition for those kind of teams. The next monster is Otomade. Now this one is one that I 
I'm slightly down on, and I think I'm actually correct being slightly down on it. Uh, it did get hyped up a little bit by some people when it came out, um, but it's it's too restricted. So um, it has got you know high defense. It's got surprisingly high speed, which does mean it's a bit of a pain. And then it has these anti moves, which are all piercing one shots only 100 seconds, um, and it takes out particular types of monsters. Um, the issue is that Link, Solo, and Raw. Yeah, monsters have them, but not actually that many monsters have them. Raw is probably the most common, but even that is not it's not super common. Um, so between those three moves, the, you'll sometimes find targets, but it won't necessarily... Really, the, the, the key thing with monsters like this is you don't necessarily get to kill the monster that you want to kill. And there's a huge difference between having one ran, you know one target that you weren't able to choose and being able to kill anything you want. So Ultimate does not do you know any of that killing anything you want. Uh, the anti-secret though is the one move that is good. So basically, for plus three cost, uh, Ultimate can come in, stealths your team, and then kills one thing that you want. But then from that point onwards, she doesn't do a whole lot. Um, maybe it's the kind of monster that you would use in a team uh, and then kill off. Uh, you know, you could use her in the front line, relatively high speed, piercing kill something that you want to kill, and then. Uh, then backstab her with something else. Probably a good uh, candidate for that kind of setup. Um, but otherwise, not a super powerful generic use kind of monster. Um, but certainly certainly interesting, but I would say it's more on the side of being a bit gimmicky than actually really powerful. The next legendary is one that I have actually underrated. Um, I am definitely going to move this higher in uh, the tier lists, because um, since they buffed it, I, and I kind of realised one key thing uh, about it, um, I realised it's a lot stronger than it than I originally thought. So this was pretty bad when it came out, and that probably may be bias against it, um, but they've since uh, made it a lot better. So this is a really cool design. Um, it's tanky because it's got hardened carapace, and, um, you know, I said I said Water got a, a bunch of high defence monsters. The, the ones which we've seen so far... Well, the, the first one, Articles, was, you know, an aggressive monster, but... Uh, and the next one we're going to do is full defense. We just saw one which was standard defense before that full defense. Here we've got one that is not full defense, but it's got hardened carapace. Like, basically all of them are tanky. Uh, it's just articles that wasn't. Um, so yeah, tanky monster. And then uh, it wants to kind of go through these different moves, these different death bites. So it needs one kill, and then it can do death bite, death bite two, death bite three, death bite four. Um, that's the way it works. They get progressively faster. They're all, um, like, instant killing an enemy. Um, I think they're actually, uh, like, really high damage piercing. Um, I can't remember exactly. Um, but anyway, basically, they kill an enemy. PvP, it, it kills. It's just PvE, you know, if they're super, super buffed, would it actually kill them? I, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, they made Scalebreaker be piercing. This is really, really good. Uh, because it means it can kill a lot more things. Uh, the damage from it is is decent. And the key thing that I was kind of underrating about this is you can make something possible to kill. Um, so, obviously with any monster that has any kind of like blood move, um, you need to, uh, you can put an enemy to hold ground and then kill that enemy off. So I always thought like, yeah, okay, you can do that, but it depends on the enemy team having a whole ground monster and it lining up and all that kind of stuff. Um, however, what you can do is you can create some kind of token in the enemy team and then kill that token with Scalebreaker. So that opens up actually a lot more uh, lot more setups that you can do with it. And Scallop and Dragon is really, really strong once it's got a kill. So it's very much a good payoff, like something worthwhile doing that kind of thing for. Um, so if you, you just need some kind of like token gen token generation, you know, it could be a motor dragon or, or something like that. And um, if you have that in it, uh, in the team with Scallop and Dragon probably Skull Open Dragon is going to be very, very strong. Um, otherwise, you know, reptiles are around the place, and so being able to uh, to kill them, it, that comes up too. Um, I think Skull Breaker does about 1,000 damage, and 1,000 piercing damage is enough to finish off a lot of monsters that, you know, you could hit something down, it goes onto lowish health, and then you can Scale Breaker it to finish it off. Um, so yeah, it, it basically it works a lot more than you'd think. Um, and then once it's got a kill, you know, basically you kill a random enemy, 
um, and the full heal on each of the death bites is, is key because it's got hardened carapace. Um, it makes it really hard to deal with, you know, only 100 seconds to deal with it after the first death bite. That's doable, but a bit awkward. And then 70 seconds after the second one, you're not really doing that. Then it's 50 seconds, like, you're not really doing that. And then <laughs> it uses death bite 4, and it just kills off all the enemies, uh, which is which is kind of crazy. Um, so it's a ticking time bomb um, that sometimes you can ignore a bit because, you know, it needs to get that first kill. But it's surprisingly easy to set up that first kill, uh, much easier than I was thinking. And uh, because it's got sleep immunity, you can use this in 101 with some kind of setup as well. Um, which I think is pretty crazy. Uh, the more that I thought about this, the more I was thinking, I would love to be using this in my 101 setups, actually. <laughs> because that's where Death Bite is like completely unstoppable. Because if you put the enemies to sleep and you get a kill of this, uh, they're only going to be like one or two uh, monsters that are awake. And they can't kill Skullopen Dragon off while it's doing the Death Bite because it keeps healing itself and it's got hardened carapace. Um, so... It can much more easily get to death bite four, uh, which yeah, like I said, it's going to win you the game if you if you can pull that off. Um, so there's a lot of um, you know this is not really the high risk high reward uh, that it might look at first glance. It's actually uh, something very doable that gives you a massive reward if you can pull it off. Um, yeah, I, I really like this monster, um, I, and I, I did not at all when it came out <laughs> at first. I was thinking, like, this is really bad, you know, any repulse just ruins it, and, you know, there's all this other stuff. Um, but, you know, you can even protect from that by having uh, things in your team that are, um, uh, you know, can kill, like, can backbite, basically. So you can, you know, plan for if it fails, you can remove it. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. So it, it's just a very strong monster. The last thing to mention is it is a bug, um, which is also really useful because we all got Manta Samurai this year. Manta Samurai is a bug with Union Attack that has one on one. My god, they did this uh, the same year that Manta Samurai came out. I am surprised that I did not catch on to this earlier. Um, it's only more recently, since Scope and Dragon, I kind of realised it's good. I was then like, wait a second, <laughs> this is really, really strong to combine with uh, Manta Samurai. Um, yeah, just seems absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, also, the speed of Manta Samurai is like slightly higher than Scolopid Dragon. Um, so if you come up against a team and you don't want to do the one-on-one, um, then you can instead use Union Attack, which is an easy way to put anything to hold ground if there's a hold ground there, um, which then can set up Scolopid Dragon. So, you know, it's just excellent. Um, we also got, uh, what's it called? Beetle Brute, that is another bug... Um, with hardened carapace um, and whole ground actually, but uh, that has union attack and it's slightly higher speed than skull open dragon. So using the three of those together, maybe you throw in an Ixia as stun protection as the fourth. Um, you've then got two sleep immune monsters. So if you want to do the one on one, you can do the one on one. If you want to go for the union attack stuff, where you've got you know two bugs with union attack and uh, they can set up skull open dragon, just amazing. Really really strong setup um, in bug union that did not exist. Uh, at all before this year, but they had it, you know, they added Manta Samurai and Skull Open Dragon, which has created this setup. Um, so yeah, talked about this long enough. A uh, really cool monster. I like it a lot. Next we have Sturgeonidus. This um, is a really, really fun, um, flavorful design. Um, but before I talk about how powerful it is, it's ridiculously powerful. Uh, but Leonidas is from like the classic uh, Spartans 300 when they're fighting off the Persians. And... Um, I, I loved the flavorful design here because it's kind of like uh, Leonidas um, in that battle where, you know, you think they've died off, um, you know, from this unstoppable force, but they keep they keep coming back, they keep fighting back, and <laughs> Sturgeonidas has fighting spirit. Um, it also, uh, if it gets stunned, which, you know, stun is like Persian army, this unbeatable massive Persian army, and um, stun kills it but then it, it revives uh so yeah it, it fights off against stun amazingly well and um i love the uh i love how that fits um i i don't know if uh if maybe i'm extrapolating slightly more than uh the flavor that they they intended but um i do think it's very cool there so uh yeah this is this is what the community wanted this is what the community was asking for when they were saying stun is too oppressive stun is too strong we need to deal with stun give us a strong counter to stun Sturgeonidus is that counter, and my god, 
they went for it. This is so powerful uh, that it's, I believe, probably in the future, um, this is going to be one of the monsters we look back to as like, this was power creep. You know, it basically kills stun by itself. And also it uh, is like tanky and su super high damage and everything. Um, you know, this this pushes power creep. Um, and I will talk about it more, you know, in a few minutes when we're at the end of this video. But uh, they really went all out with some of the legendaries this year. Um, and Sturgeonitis is one of those. Um, so breaking down the moveset a bit more. Um, stun is what it counters. Thundering Rebirth, it revives when it dies. Um, so it revives when it gets stunned uh, over 200 seconds, which is basically most stuns in the game. Like, if there's any stun that happens to your team, Sturdenlidus absorbs it and then revives himself. And he's got reasonable enough speed that that is very, like, uh, a very harsh counter. It's not like he's 20% speed, so it, you know, puts him out of play for a bit. It's like, no, it, usually it brings him back far higher into play than, you know, where he is at the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, really harsh counter to stun. And... Um, you know, I mentioned earlier in this video about the uh, the counters to stun, the passives that, you know, make them revive and stuff. Making one revive was, was one of my ideas. I did not say 200 seconds, though, so I, I won't take credit for that. I think this is, like, pushing it a bit too far, maybe. Um, so, full defense, which is just amazing for him tanking, uh, makes it really hard to get rid of him because he hasn't got any killer weaknesses. Um, if you want to stun, you know, how do you do it? You, any stun that you do at the time while he's on the battlefield just does nothing. In fact, it uh, it will heal him up if he's been hurt at all. And you need to kill this full defense monster that has no killer weaknesses. That is kind of crazy. Uh, the damage from it is perfectly fine. Not only does it have this fighting spirit that, you know, doubles the attack, which means that all the, all the damage moves become really strong... Also, these moves are stronger than they normally are. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think I think they're 1.5 times damage than they normally are. So that Union attack is, you know, what other monsters have as Union attack, but it does 1.5 times the damage than it normally does. Um, so when Sturdenlidus has Fighting Spirit, it easily one-shots things. Nullifying Strike one-shots things. Um, but if it doesn't have Fighting Spirit, Union attack still one-shots things. Um... Nullifying Strike doesn't isn't strong enough at that point, um, but yeah, basically this is this is like crazy aggression, crazy crazy aggression on a super tanky monster with no killer weaknesses that completely counters stun. Oh, my God, and uh, Union Attack, as I said previously, this is a 100 second move, um, very very strong. This is also a water monster that's aquatic with Union Attack really fits into, um, you know, any kind of link water setup, but actually you can use it outside of that very easily because of Padron Orca being such a top-notch PvP monster, um, and there's a few other aquatic monsters around that you can use this with. So there's various uh, setups that you can use it in, and then use Union Attack to be very oppressive, but like I said, even Nullifying Strike one-shots things. Um, I would say it's not ideal to do that because... Um, if you go below your 70% HP, Nullifying Strike won't always, you know, it won't really one-shot things nicely um, that you want to have the Union Attack to fall back on, but it's still actually strong enough that it's worth what, worth doing. Um, this is a monster that I would put in basically any team. I don't own it. <laughs> if I did, I would definitely use it a lot. Um, the other thing to note about Nullifying Strike is that um, it won't one-shot tankier monsters, However, remember that you've got the instant stun killer too. So you can do the instant stun killer first, followed up by nullifying strike, and that means that it basically kills, you know, a high percentage of monsters. Um, yeah, really, really solid. Great damage dealer. Obviously, you try to charge the bloodthirst, and then you can use bloodthirst, uh, but it also counters revenges, and the union, it really pushes union. Um, yeah, so many strong things about this monster. It is unbelievably powerful. And um, I, I'm sure we'll see this, uh, you know, in a year or two down the line, it's going to be used so much. So now we've got the one mythic to talk about. This one won't take a lot of explaining. There's not too much to going on going on with it, really. Um, basically, it's a Link Water monster. Um, the main move on it is High Tide. So you need one water teammate to use High Tide. Now, why is it Link? Well, if you don't have a water teammate, AOI can... Um, Actually, I don't know how to say a name. I kind of want to say AOI, but that's just spelling out the letters. AOI? AOI, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, 
if you don't have a water teammate, all she can do is uh, Element Massacre, which is not a good move, or Flame Eater, which is, you know, only fire monsters. The other moves just aren't very good, sorry I bashed the desk there. Um, so she doesn't really do much unless you've got water teammates. And so if you use her with like, you know, one or two water monsters around, well then basically your opponent is going to kill those water monsters and leave her around and she's going to be a complete dead weight. So she's basically got to be used in Link Water. And then in Link Water what she does is, you know, she gets a turn as soon as she comes in, she can high tide something, and she's got stun converter. Looks kind of good on paper, you know, 130 second move, uh, 130 second sweeping with stun converter. However, in practice, I would say she's just kind of a fine. You know, she's a fine include, nothing too overpowered. Reason being is high tide doesn't pierce, it doesn't go around protectors, and in fact, it doesn't even one shot the tankiest mythics. Um, and you know, slight spoiler here, but you know. We know now, a few months after the anniversary, HP boost is a bit of a thing. So when people have HP boosted mythics, AI cannot really kill things properly. So she's not actually that anything special. Um, that said, you know, if you're playing a Link Water team, she's a solid include. She does a good job of just, you know, coming in and killing things. She's basically like uh, like a Cellar Shine, um, a Cellar Shine with Stun Converter. Slightly better than Cellar Shine, but not... not like that much better than Settler Shine, basically. Uh, this was the other massive counter to Link Fire. Um, you know, Roaring Entrance with Flame Eater and Stun Converter. That's pretty harsh against Link Fire. Um, so if Link Fire becomes a thing again, then she's going to do a good job. But the thing that I found weird with this one, and why I didn't like her so much as a counter to it, is you've got to use her in Link Water. And is Link Water struggling against Link Fire? Probably not. <laughs> so you don't really need a counter to Link Fire in your Link Water team. But anyway, um, yeah, that's that's AY or AY or have you said? Someone tell me, uh, please, in the comments, because I have no idea how to pronounce her name. Now the highlights from this year. Well, you know, I kind of highlighted when talking about them. Um, I don't have to scroll up a dragon on here. Uh, that's one which I've kind of more recently but come to love and I think it has potential. I might be wrong about it though, I don't know. Um in terms of like what I think's really cool from this year though, um more generally speaking, not on a bias perspective, Sturgeonidas is just crazy stun protection and just a super powerful monster. Uh it's the, the community's monster. <laughs> it's it's what people wanted and I hope they're happy. I hope it's done enough to just control stun that we don't need any anything more i think stun is now controlled last year i said it's the year of stun protection i highlighted all these different monsters that are good at stun protection this year we got some more powerhouse ones uh sturgeonidas and uh they buffed onyxia so onyxia is really good um yeah you know ugh, we just keep getting some stun counters and there's enough in the game now i think um sturgeonidas is, is an awesome one for it uh Talking about stun counters, down at the bottom, we've got uh, Sataskagun. The auto mega bomb um, is really, really cool. Um, I think it's great for PvE, doing that kind of thing. Um, and otherwise, very interesting for PvP. It is viable in PvP. It's not the most insane one, but it is a good monster for that. And then also, uh, Articles, I think is a really cool take on a protector. Um, I love the design of it. And, you know, we're talking about stun protection. Again, it's a stun converter. <laughs> we, we got a lot of uh, either stun protection or stun converters in water this year, um, which has uh, boosted it quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, articles, cool monster. Uh, and then in terms of the overall power, well, we got a lot of good legendaries, basically. Um, Sturgeonidas is the insane one. Otherwise, there are no other insane ones, but definitely very good ones. And Aoi which I, you know, sounded a bit of, a little bit down on. It's a solid include for Link Water teams. Uh, definitely a good monster, just nothing too, you know, special. It's not a standout one uh, compared to other mythics. Um, we also got the um, Super Epic, which, um, oh, I was saying on the last screen that uh, <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, lot of stun protection. Uh, yeah, yeah, we got crazy amounts of stun protection in Water this, this year. Um, so that's definitely something which uh, Water has got stronger in. Um, compared to how it was in previous years. Um, yeah, Water did decently. So now we've gone through all the monsters in the game uh, that came out this year. It's time to summarise this year and talk about kind of generally what happened. Well, I call this the Year of Union. Uh, the slight abbreviation for Union and Type Killer. I think 
that is where design is going. And a slight aside, uh, we can't see the monster types in the game uh, while we're in a battle. I really hate that. I really hope that they add it in. About a year ago, I was asking them, like, uh, you know, as soon as we started getting in this union stuff, I was like, oh, you know, could we have that displayed in the game? So, like, where it's got the little, little circle that shows the element type, I'd love for there to be, like, you know, another little circle off it which shows the monster type. Um, I think that would be a, an important include uh, at some point in the next year um, so that we can see monster types properly in the battle and figure out union and, and uh, that kind of thing. I mean, for the type killer moves, basically you can you can see it when you're going to use the move, but it'd be nice to know in advance, um, you know, what, what targets you would do it with. I have them all memorised, but, you know, most people do not spend their life analyzing all this stuff and memorizing it so you know they won't know um so yeah anyway coming back to the topic the union things that we got this year i think are kind of the most important things that we got this year which is why i wanted to call it the year of union because um they were a really big deal so starting it off in the very bottom left we've got mantis samurai that is the free legendary that everybody got it is a one-on-one -on -one monster, but it's also a bug union monster. And as I talked about in this video, Sitaskagon is like, oh, uh, sorry, not Sitaskagon, um, Scalopid Dragon is the perfect thing to combine with it. Um, there are also a bunch of other things you combine with it. Flutter Drakes are very common. You can combine it with them. In fact, it made the bug union too strong uh, that they had to nerf Manta Samurai uh, because um, he, he was just way too oppressive with bug union. And that's the first time we've ever had in the game where union has had to be nerfed. And uh, yeah, anyway, so Manta Samurai, very important monster from this year. Done a good thing and um, lots of people will be using it, I'm sure. Uh, we also got Sturgeonidus in the top left there which is a crazy stun counter, uh, well, counter to stun, and it can be used in basically any team, but it is better in Union teams. Um, so that's, you know, it's something that's going to be used for years to come, and it will help push Aquatic Union, I am certain. Uh, Sheikah Bloom was one of the strongest monsters from this year. That's Beast Union. Beasts are very common as well, uh, so that will definitely be used a lot. Sorrel, one of the best mythics in the game. Bird Union. Everyone has access to it in the shop. Sure, yeah, you've got to save up 80 uh, six-star tickets, which takes a long time, but it is, it's worth it. And um, yeah, definitely one of the most uh, kind of standout monsters from this year. And then there's a few other ones there, you know, a couple of them, not that amazing, but we did get an awesome reptile uh, union monster, Ready Bug, and then Akane, Dragon Union. Dragons are so common. Uh, Akane, I'm kind of on the fence about exactly how powerful she is, but I do feel like she could be very strong. Uh, suddenly in a Dragon Union setup, she would be pretty strong. Um, so yeah, some very powerful kind of important monsters that came out this year that are Union monsters, and that's why I wanted to call it the Year of Union. And then on the right, we also have the Type Killer monsters, um, which, you know, there's only four to be fair, but Type Killer moves are obviously going to become a bigger deal in the future. Uh, when we get more of them, they should definitely be adding that icon so we can see what types uh, enemies are. But uh, for now, you know, we haven't got too many that have the type killer moves. Um, the two at the top, you know, maybe they're not so played, but the two at the bottom, they are like <laughs> some of the... Well, Volpig's like one of the best super, super epics we've ever seen. Rhino World has been probably the most meta-defining monster of the last year that has come out. And uh, yeah, they both deal with uh with types uh monster types so it's definitely going to be a thing looking to the future that we're going to have uh monster types mattering and people building around union people countering union with uh certain type killer moves um it's a cool extra aspect to go into in the game and uh definitely we need those kind of things it's not just the archetypes of poison sleep stun then mortar mark link you know we need more to go into and union has a lot of depth to it because there are so many different monster types in the game um, that it can create all these different interesting teams. Um, and we need that kind of diversity. Uh, it's another way they can like push a monster as well, like Sheikah Bloom, for example. Very, very strong monster, but you have to use it in Beast Union. Um, so, yeah, cool stuff. I really like the way this uh, is going design-wise. I hope they do more of it. Um, I hope they are, you know, careful to some extent, um, but... Like I said, it is somewhere where they can kind of push the power level of some things, um, especially in some of those monster types which are less well supported, uh, like for example Bug. Uh, they did go a bit over the top, uh, but uh, but um, 
you know, technically they could uh, they could go with that, and you know they could do it with like demons and uh, angels and stuff. I mean, Angel Union that sounds that sounds really cool. Uh, I'd love to see what that's like. So that was the all the Union kind of summary. In terms of the power of the monsters, uh, this is a big slide. If you're looking at this on a mobile screen, you probably can't see properly, but you can see roughly where things are. So these were the tables that I used at the end of uh, all my videos, and they're just kind of slapped there together. On the next screen, we're going to see them all combined in one big table, but I wanted to split it over the elements as well, so you can kind of see this. I didn't do this last year, um, uh, even though I made these tables. I, I, I uh, didn't put them on one slide. Um, uh, I thought it would be very useful to see. So you've probably been looking at this while I've been talking and trying to figure out, um, you know, what's going on. Well, we're not going to talk overall because that will be the next slide. But looking across the elements, you can see uh, there's a slight different, you know, layout of them, uh, especially to do with um, how many monsters came out. <laughs> uh, Storm and fire in the middle and um, quite blank. <laughs> and then you've got earth and uh, shadow on the on the left, which has a, they have a lot of monsters. Um, I'm not going to break down every single one of them, I mean I've talked loads about all these things uh, in the previous videos, but I will talk about the what I've listed at the bottom here. So in terms of the new additions, what order would I rank the uh, elements in terms of what they got power-wise and you know how well they were supported? Uh, I feel like Shadow got the best support. It got two of the strongest mythics in the game. Uh, like I said, Sorrel I have since moved up to S+. Um, it is definitely one of the strongest mythics. Kamada is the strongest mythic in the game. Um, so getting those was kind of crazy. I've also moved the Shadow Helen, Helen Fox up to S+. Um, it's one of the best legendaries in the game. Uh, the other one that's uh, high there, the um, Ludi Faith, that I don't know exactly where I want to place it, but it's clearly very strong and it supports Link Shadow and the fact that Shadow's getting loads more support that's very promising for the future. Um, so Shadow got a few very, very powerful monsters, as well as like a bunch of other ones, which are, you know, filler, average, you know, they, they can go in some teams maybe. Um, uh, Akane, I said, you know, I'm, I'm on the fence about, don't know exactly, might be really strong. Um, so yeah, Shadow got some really, the best support, really. The other one that was in contention for first is Earth. Um, it got Maple Dragon, one of the best super epics we've ever had, Rhino Whirl very strong monster, and a few other really strong legendaries. Um, it got more strong legendaries than uh, Shadow did, but on the Mythics front, Shadow really trumped it. So uh, I gave the edge to Shadow, but Earth also got a bunch of really strong stuff. Um, Ready Bug as well. Uh, I have since moved it up. I think it's insane support for reptiles. It's very strong, really good in PvE as well. Um, so yeah, they got they got a f quite a few uh, strong uh, legend legendaries and super epics. Next slide, Class Water. We talked about it in this video. Um, a bunch of solid legendaries, uh, a lot of stun protection, and kind of modern style stuff that will work very well. Water got really uh, came out really well from this. Um, the other one that I was I was on the fence about: do I put Water then Holy or the other way around? Holy did well in that it got an insane super epic and insane legendary, <laughs> but it only got one of each. You know. <laughs> What do you? Uh, I've got to pick somehow. Like, how do I? How do I class it in like the 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 quantity or the quality? And I I pick water over it. But water uh, holy got a couple of exceptionally strong monsters. And then on the on the mythics, um, something I found myself doing in that video was I was talking about how each one of them should be buffed. Um, yeah, I mean they're they're kind of average or below average, um, but they are. You know, there's a couple of decent ones there. Quenazillion is good. Coretto is very, very cool and, and pretty good. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why I have it down there at fourth. Um, held up by the Shika Bloom and the Volpink. And then Fire and Storm, I think basically they got kind of even support. I mean, basically it's it's like one standout thing. Um, you know, Fire did get the amazing Mythic uh, on the Super Epic, fr Super Epic front. It got some, you know, good stuff, but not nothing crazy, um, and Storm basically got one good legendary. <laughs> I mean, I put Storm in sixth there, but I did say equals. Probably Fire should be higher, to be honest. Um, yeah, they, they both came out quite poorly. Those were the two, kind of the two strongest Link elements, really. I mean, uh, I really liked Water, um, 
but I would say Storm was the strongest, so it didn't really need much support. Fire was the most played one, and, and it needed a bit of a, like, a kind of, you know, put the brakes on, uh, don't give us too many more fire things. So, um, yeah, I'm not too surprised that Storm and Fire didn't get much support this year. In terms of Link, where do I think each of the elements stand now? So, Shadow is definitely on the rise. However, I don't think it really matches the top three. The top three are still the same as the top three which I said last year. However, the difference is that I now think Water is as strong as Storm. Um, so, Storm was what I would class as the strongest. It just does a whole lot. There's a lot of like really top quality monsters in it. Um, you know, it depends on which monsters you own, obviously. Like, you can, lots of you can do powerful link fire setups, for example. Um, but I think that if you had all the monsters, Storm can do some really powerful stuff and is generally uh, better than uh, other things. However, Water now, especially with the addition of Sturgeonidas, um, has has kind of matched it. Um, something that Water did sometimes struggle with is stun protection. Uh, in my Link Water team, I use Aetherian. Uh, I think it's fair to say when you do a Link team, you can use stun protection or some other things from other elements. Like, you know, Link Water doesn't mean you're using all water monsters. You only need three of the four to be water. So you would slip in some stuff from other elements to uh, basically round out some of the things that are missing. So I I don't th I wouldn't pull a downer on water because you know you need Aetherian to help it work. However, with the addition of Sturgeonidas, <laughs> it uh, you know now it doesn't need to be Aetherian. It can be some other monster. Um, yeah, water's been well supported this year, and I think now it basically matches uh, Storm in terms of power level. Fire is just behind. Uh, personally, I think it's just behind. People probably disagreed with me last year. Everyone felt like fire was the strongest link element. It was very good, you know. Um, I still beat it with my link water team. I beat it with my link storm team. I beat it with my generic teams. Um, I didn't find it to be too insane, but I can absolutely see why people found it to be too insane. It had a lot of strong pieces, a lot of very synergistic pieces. It was extremely aggressive. So if it got going, you basically couldn't come back and win. Uh, a lot of the time, you could make strong endgames with it. There's a lot you could do, but I did think that it was a bit weaker than uh, Storm and Water. And now that it's been nerfed, and the others have been supported a bit, I do think Fire is 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 kind of, it's the third place. So then we got a bit of a drop uh, to the other elements. I think, though, certainly Earth and Shadow are on the rise. Um, they haven't quite hit the same level as the top three, but... Uh, they are kind of as good as each other now, especially Shadow was uh, the worst, and then it's overtaken Holy, I think. Um, Earth and Shadow have a lot of very strong pieces now. Um, it's a shame that some of the monsters, like for example Rhinoel in Earth, exceptional monster, but it is a solo monster. And um, you know, I, I find it a little sad when I see that on some of these, uh, you know, some of these like less well supported Link elements. You see it a bit unholy sometimes, like Brain Hilda, for example. Cool monster, really good, but it's link it's a solo monster. Momo, one of the strongest uh mythics in the game, is in holy and it's kind of partly solo because it needs to be able to flip between stun counter and protector. Well, it, you know, it doesn't need to, but it, it helps a lot. And it can only do that if you don't have any holy teammates. <laughs> so a bit annoying um that that holds back holy a bit. Um, but yeah, anyway, so Earth and Shadow, great stuff. I think Shadow is going to get more support over the next year and is probably going to get as strong as the top three. Um, I think, I, I'm hesitant, but maybe I think they are going to end up supporting it too much that it's going to end up becoming like Link Fire where everyone's running Link Shadow and complaining, oh my god, it's too overpowered, it's too strong. Um, but we'll see. Uh, hopefully it doesn't go that way because... Um, it needs its time in the limelight, <laughs> having been the worst for so long. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so that's that's enough to talk about on this slide. Um, let's move on to the, the really big table. This big table shows all the monsters that came out this year. Um, I suppose it's a little smaller than it was last year because there are fewer monsters. Um, but it can give you a general impression just from looking at the size of the each of the sections, how well things did. So last year, one of the things I talked about was how there was a diagonal line, like going from uh, Mythics right down at the bottom in PvE, 
and that uh, that was kind of the average and then the average in pvp was a little bit higher then in legendary's pve a little bit higher legendary's pvp a bit higher and then super epics were kind of up at the top like there was a very definite diagonal line and last year i was talking about how you know this is generally how it will be because super epics uh they try and make strong super epics nowadays because otherwise they're just not going to be used at all there's a lot of older and weak super epics as well so just generally speaking lots of them will be above those legendaries to some extent is the same there's a lot of older legendaries so like they tend to make newer ones stronger and so you know that already starts that diagonal line and then mythics we've got a load of really strong mythics um already and they're kind of a newer thing and so a lot of the newer ones they build them a bit more for pvp than pve so you know it's like diagonal line there and the average they tend to go more kind of like the mid-range and then with only a few monsters that are like top-notch uh, mythics however this year it's not actually that diagonal line which i'll talk about in a second but i just wanted to make one point which was um i should say in terms of my bias on how i rate things something that i've noticed uh which i have known for years is i tend to underrate monsters when they first come out i am very harsh on them and i put them down slightly lower than they should be um i purposely don't put things in s plus immediately unless i'm like this is definitely an s plus because i like to uh see it in practice a bit I'd rather put something up into S+, plus when I've decided, like, yes, this is one of the top monsters, than to assume that and then, like, shift it down and then try and figure out where it goes, you know. Um, so, I tend to underrate things a bit, which means that, generally speaking, uh, for example, last year, everything should, well, some of the things should have been a bit higher than they were. So, I talked a lot last year about how the mythics that came out were below average. They are pretty bad. However they were a little bit closer to the average than I was showcasing in that video. Um, it was definitely noteworthy that they were below average, but it wasn't quite as extreme as, as I was showing. So this year, when we look at the mythics and them being below average, I don't want to be saying, again, like, these mythics are really bad that came out this year. However, they are, I believe, a little bit below average. Um, and I think that's a really good thing. Uh, I think it's really good apart from the fact that this way they've been doing it where they just they drip feed us some really really strong mythics occasionally each year uh it means that because of the way mythics we hatch them like we have to target specific mythics um basically people will go for those stronger mythics and because there's a few standout mythics you know uh, three this year let's say it's three each year We've had mythics for like four years now. That's like 12 mythics. So if people all get those 12 mythics, they kind of outclass the other mythics. And being top mythics, they kind of outclass all the legendaries. So it, we can reach this point where, because of the Fortune Shrine and stuff and people being able to afford mythics, basically everyone will play the top mythics. And if you're not playing the top mythics, you're going to lose. Um, which is a shame because you want a lot of uh, a lot of monsters that are viable that are you know so you have this diversity and that kind of stuff and if you make generically strong mythics that are like outclassing other ones it does detract from that so yeah uh with all that said you know i don't want to be too negative about things um i don't want to be too negative about Camilla, um but i do think they need to be careful with some of that stuff um, maybe also consider some of these generic use ones that are like getting used loads to nerf them for the reason of trying to promote diversity. Um, yeah, uh, some of the mythics which I have up at the top are part of certain archetypes. For example, Fiona is part of a, you know, stealth support archetype. Uh, you wouldn't really use her outside of there. Um, and, you know, I can't remember all the other ones, but like there's like a stun one and that kind of stuff. There are things which, uh, you wouldn't necessarily use in every team. Um, and those are the safer ones to make stronger. Uh, but yeah, so that's enough talking about that. The line, this first point, I'm going to put it on screen now, um, or I may have done already, uh, to show the sort of line across uh, the monsters. So it's not a diagonal line this year. Instead, we have a peak on the legendaries. <laughs> the legendaries were insanely powerful this year. And as I said uh, earlier on this video, some of the legendaries I've moved up higher. So for example, if you look at legendaries in PvP in the S I've got the Shadow Ellen Fox and Shooker Bloom at S there. I've moved them both up to S+. We got four S+, legendaries this year. That is way more than we've had in previous years, I believe. Um, I, th I think I only have, like, just over ten monsters in there 
from the seven years this has been going on. And so the fact that four of them came out in the last year um, is is very significant. Um, yes, we got strong legendaries this year. I think that the legendaries were stronger than the mythics that we got this year, other than the, you know, the standout mythics, basically. <clears throat> uh, and the super epics... They were less uh, less impressive this year than last year in terms of on average, but I think that's mostly because they've been brought down by the Gummy Dragons and the Elfin Dragons being bad overall. So, you know, they are like... Well, there's uh, there are only three of the four Gummy Dragons that I've put into this, um, but that is nine Super Epics. Um, so they bring down the average quite a bit. And if you look at the bottom, actually, of the Super Epics, that, you know, the bottom ones are the Elfin Dragons. Um, so they kind of swing the average... Um, but actually, if you look at Super Epics at the top, Maple Dragon and Volpink are both S plus in both lists. Those are insane Super Epics, absolutely insane. And we've got a few other Super Epics there that are that are very strong. Um, so we got a few standout Super Epics, a few standout Mythics, and then a lot of really strong Legendaries. That's basically how this year went. Um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting that that's the that's the design that they seem to be going for. Uh, like I was saying drip feeding in some a few really powerful mythics giving us a few powerful super epics that you know mean they're very definitely viable you know we use them they're strong and then putting a lot of power into legendaries um so that kind of brings up the bulk of what people are playing with uh, they're far more accessible than these mythics and it means that everyone can be playing with you know with these legendaries and and uh, enjoying the game so overall you know they're doing a good job i like it uh, the power that we got this year was very impressive. I think uh, there are a few monsters in it which really show power creep, which I've been very hesitant to say that in the past. I think that they've managed to control power creep really nicely. A little bit of history on that. Uh, the first three years of the game we didn't have mythics, and the power level that we got in the second year as opposed to the first year was noticeably more, and then the third year as opposed to the previous two years was much, much more. That third year, we got so many really, really strong legendaries that are still used today. Like, they are, like, among the strongest legendaries. Um, they make up, you know, they're kind of like the bulk of, of those uh, of those upper tiers of legendaries. And uh, they said, basically, that they had to do this in order to keep selling them and that kind of stuff. Like, they had this power creep problem, and Mythics were one of the ways that they sorted that. So, by bringing out Mythics, it meant that they could... Um, they could choose exactly, you know, how they were handling power so that they could bring out uh, Mythics as the high-ticket item. Some of them could be really powerful. And then uh, Legendaries they could make strong, but because Mythics have naturally higher stats, those Legendaries aren't quite so insanely oppressive compared to Mythics. So you could kind of balance the power level between the two. And you can see since then they've still been doing that when you look at these Mythics. And actually the bulk of the Mythics they're bringing out are uh, actually kind of weaker than the strongest legendaries. I mean, if you look at the bulk of the legendaries are bought on the mythics, they're about kind of similar. But the top level of the legendaries is higher than that, and then the top level of mythics is even higher than that. That's kind of what they've been doing with the design, and it's meant that they've kind of held back power creep for quite a few years. But I think this most recent year, they have pushed power creep with some things, and uh, there's definitely some standout legendaries that are insanely powerful, um, and, and mythics, like I said. So that is all the points that I wanted to make about general power level and that kind of thing. One other thing I'd like to talk about is how the PvP meta has kind of changed and uh, has gone with design. Now, I can't remember exactly what I've said in the past, um, in like, you know, one or two years ago, but something I, I think I've tried to hint at is that uh, the game has gone slightly more towards um, backbite type stuff and controlling what you have on the battlefield. And that has become a far more key thing in PvP. They made it a bigger thing, and they've been able to push the token disruption. So that is one of the ways that uh, that PvP games are playing out. Now, over the course of the last year, this has very much been the case because of key things like Rhinoel, Jacqueline, and then now more recently, Maple Dragon. Those three monsters are being used a lot. They create enemy uh, tokens in the enemy team. And then you have monsters that, you know, will be killing them off, like Sorrel and, and that kind of stuff. And that's become a much bigger deal in PvP. Um, it's something that I've been noticing slowly over time. Um, it also is nice when that is the meta stuff because there are some monsters which want to kill off teammates for particular benefit, and those have always been a bit awkward to set up because you haven't always been able to, you know, like, it, it, killing off one of your teammates is is a big is a big thing, 
Like, you know, you're removing a monster from your team. So you kind of want to get some benefit from it or to line it up well. And, um, yeah, they've been pushing the thing, uh, the game in that direction. Where's it been going away from? It's the archetypes. So the original archetypes of the game were stun, poison, and sleep. And those were a massive deal early on in the game. Now, poison has sort of ebbed and flowed. It's come and gone uh, occasionally. It depends on the meta. Uh, sleep has always kind of been there on the fringes, you know, a bit of sleep and stuff has always been strong. Uh, Malwing and Sober King having the Tranquilizing Entrance has been a big deal, uh, but yeah, it's, a little bit of sleep has always been involved. Uh, one on one, a bit on the fringe as well. Stun has been a key thing through the game, it's been very, very uh, prominent, uh, counters to it and stuff. It's been probably the core of PvP for many years, and what they've really done in recent years, especially with Mythic Design, is they've pulled away from those archetypes more. So they, those archetypes still exist, but now it's slightly more about other things like element killer moves and type killer moves and setting your teammates up with link and union and that kind of stuff. Token disruption, killing off teammates to, uh, to like have the, have the um, control of the battlefield. That's where they've gone, and I think it's actually done a lot of good for the game. Um, I think that someone who, you know, played the game in the past, they came back, they wouldn't necessarily know this, but they noticed this, but they would, if they played long enough, they would realise the game's really shifted in that direction, and uh, there's a lot more to really think about and, and do with that stuff. It has meant that in PvP, some um, older players have got frustrated that it, you just see a lot of these generic use monsters, like Padron Orca and, like, say, Catmander and stuff, you see them around a lot. Um, but I would say that's somewhat more healthy, that those are kind of the the standard, and then you have the archetypes and other things as, like, coming off that, that you can then, you know, dip into those and use those, rather than the core being stun, and being like, okay, we all need to build stun and counter stun, and trying to do anything else is really difficult. <laughs> um, so, uh, and same with Poison, like when Poison's been around and it's been like taking over the meta, it has been really oppressive to any other kind of strategy uh, because it's so aggressive. Um, they've also brought in lots more shields and stealth and that kind of stuff, which is really cool. It means that, like I said earlier, like Stealth Bane is, is now a really big deal in the game uh, to counter things. And uh, yeah, like I hope that's given you some kind of insight into how things are. Um, the thing that I banged on about last year, you know, it's still true of they're making everything tankier um, with the high defensive stuff. Certain moves are not really viable anymore. Like, you need to be doing high damage to things. You also need to take advantage of these high defense monsters to try and stop when the opponent is using low attack monsters uh, to, you know, just to basically punish that. And um, certainly a lot of the tanky mythics have done a really good job of that. Like, if you play the tanky mythics, you will find... Yes, you meet <laughs> opponents who are not using enough strong monsters that can actually, you know, kill these mythics. Um, so, you know, people looked at that and they say power creep. I would say it's a general kind of design shift and it means that, you know, some monsters, yes, they have ended up becoming outdated. Other ones uh, have, have, like, you know, come well out of it. And, um, yeah, that's how things are moving. That's how design's going. I hope that's enough insight. I'll stop rambling about that. Let's finish this up with me talking about my most powerful, uh, the most powerful monsters I thought from the year and my favourites. So the most powerful ones, obviously, they're just kind of here in the tier list. Uh, let's talk about mythics first. Three clear standout ones, you know, Carmilla, just absolutely broken, so tanky, easily kills things, and just really, really oppressive. Uh, you can use it anywhere. Brilliant behind protectors. Loads of stuff you can do with it. it it's just so powerful. Soral. Far more interesting, um, but definitely very, very strong. Uh, yeah, not going to talk about each one of these, so let's just move on. Orochi, very strong monster. It's weird that Fire didn't get much support this year, but it did get Orochi, which is very, very strong. Um, something I think I mentioned in, in that video was uh, how you can use it with, like, Death Gazer behind it. And then, uh, so from the Death Entrance, if it kills one of your team, well then Death Gazer can enter, and then give Orochi a turn basically instantly, and then you can go straight into the stun Fulu to then, you know, stun all the enemies and just take control of the battle. It's one of the ways you can use Death Entrance to your advantage. So yeah, Orochi, very strong, uh, definitely cool if you can build her around her well. And then in terms of, like, what I pick for, like, the fourth and fifth, um, I think Akane and Kurata 
are both really good. Coretta is um, uh, actually yeah yeah it is Coretta. I, I was I was worried for a second that it was like Coletta or something. It's Coretta. Um, Coretta is very strong in the right setup. Akane I think uh, I think is very good. Um, it's hard to hard to get a complete grasp on though. Uh, but yeah, I'd say those are probably the five most powerful mythics uh, from this year. Looking at the legendaries, uh, as I said earlier, Ellen Fox, uh, the Shadow version, and Shika Bloom, I have in S Plus now. Those are both crazily good. Shika Bloom, amazing beast stuff. Um, Ellen Fox, amazing stun control, sweeping, it's tanky. Sturgeonitis, tanky, stun protection. Rhino Well, a decent monster, plus with an insane broken entrance. Uh, those four are just like clear standouts to me. And Manta Samurai is also up there as a brilliant monster, which is amazing that we all got it for free. And then with the Super Epics, basically two standout Super Epics. Uh, Maple Dragon giving you a whole lot of support. It can win a battle by sleeping enemies is like kind of the main go-to if you don't have anything better to do with it. Just start sleeping the enemies and taking control that way. Otherwise, the disruption it gives you gives you that freedom to then start doing that stuff. And the fact that it has full defense and camouflage is just just ridiculous for a super epic. Volpink, um, I like I said, I'm not going to talk about this all. Volpink is very very strong. Can use it in certain setups and uh, is very powerful. So those are what I would pick as like the strongest monsters from this year. All of them exceptionally powerful. Uh, other than like the the two mythics I went went to, the fourth and fifth, they're not like so stand out. But the ones that I talked about, they're like, really, really, really strong. Um, and my favourites from the year, well, I said this in the holy video. My favourite is Sheikah Bloom. I think Sheikah Bloom is awesome. Uh, the fact that like one of my favourite monsters is Fiona, and Sheikah Bloom and Fiona are like the perfect pair, <laughs> uh, probably helps. Um, yeah, Sheikah Bloom is is super super powerful. I love the fact that it pushes Beast Union. Um, and it only, you know, can only be used in Beast Union, um, so it kind of keeps it in check. It means that that, that archetype is its own thing. You know, you're not going to just generically throw Shika Bloom into a team with other generic strong monsters. It makes Beast Union be uh, PvP viable. And I'd love to see uh, some more monsters like Shika Bloom in different monster types to give us a more, you know, diverse... A uh, number of different things that we can build around uh, that are all uh, all strong and do the job. Um, second would be Volpink. Uh, I think Volpink is just really, really awesome. <laughs> I talked about Volpink a lot, um, and uh, it's why when I was about to talk about it a minute ago, I was like, okay, I've got to hold off. I, I can't talk about Volpink because I'm going to ramble. Um, Volpink is, is just amazing. And then the third one I would pick is uh, Coretta, uh, which is why I didn't talk about her earlier. Because Coretta, I think, is a really cool build-around monster. Um, I mean, those previous two are also kind of build-around. You can tell my style. Holy build-around monsters. Um, Coretta, the way she buffs her teammate is really, really interesting. Uh, since they buffed her that she's actually, you know, she's not so clunky, she works. Um, I think she's really cool. And the uh, there's one particular friend of mine who has her. Um, I don't really know too many other people who have her. But he he loves her. Like uh, since he's used her, he, he's just like yeah. Like she's she's so much fun to use. He's she's uh, he's used her with a few different monsters to vow, and um, always had a lot of fun with it. People who who face him and they've like um, you know I've seen in on the forum they've been like like oh my god Coretta she was she was so powerful so cool. Um, so yeah, Coretta I think is an awesome monster. Really really fun. Uh, that would have to be my my um, third pick. In terms of fourth, I don't know. Probably Adam Fox. Adam Fox is a cool one. Uh, or, oh, Rex Terminator. I think Rex Terminator is really cool. Um, it's definitely a, a fun idea, uh, mixing mortar and uh, energy. Not overpowered or broken. You know, it's balanced. It's just strong. And, uh, yeah, really good fun monster. Um, I like that kind of design. You know, sometimes we're going to have some really strong ones. Sometimes we just have some which are, like, you know, solid additions and... Um, uh, I'm glad that they they do that kind of thing as well. Um, the last one I want to mention actually is Readybug. I think Readybug is very cool. Um, should be a bit higher than I have it in this in this table. Uh, but Readybug pushing that reptile union and it's a really fun and strong monster. Like in terms of I, I said this when reviewing it in the Earth video, it does it, like, exactly what you'd want from a super epic. Where where you know it, it's a protector, it's a stun absorber, it's got um, sleep purify. It's got different killer moves. It's really interesting. Can pull back a teammate, kill off things. It, it kill off teammates. It does so much packed into it. It's so interesting to play with, and it's the right kind of power level where it really supports reptiles, 
like you wouldn't use it outside of it and uh it's not like too oppressive or pa or like broken but amazing for 10 cost um so yeah really like that and uh, those are my favorites so with all that said i hope you enjoyed uh this year's review of all the monsters i hope you learned something uh, and interesting things if you have some hot takes uh let me know in the in the comments um, I'd love to hear what other people are thinking about stuff. If you think I'm wrong with anything I've said, uh, let me know as well. Because, you know, I'm not right about everything. I just just ramble and say my opinion here. And uh, sometimes some of it comes out and it's genius. Sometimes it's, it's not at all. Uh, but yeah, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoy this series. And I will see you in a video soon. Um, I think it's going to be a guide. I'm not entirely sure. We'll see. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you then.